Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. As usual, you guys know this is one of my favorite pieces, and that is to welcome our guests because I know they're coming with a couple of things that are very expensive in my mind, time. Every one of us have 24 hours. How you learn to respect time, how you learn to honor time, how you learn to uh, love time will speak volumes about you, as well as the journey. The journey housed powerful information that created the individual. And today we have Dr. McReynolds before us, and I am so honored to have her here to have this wonderful conversation with us so that you and I can become better human spirits while we are here on this planet. Doc, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it is an honor. Um, tell the folks, how do you serve mankind? I love that phrase, how do you serve mankind? Because it's a giant um, uh, uh, way to look at things when we look at being a servant. It is bigger than us. So how do you serve? You know, I really appreciate this question um, because so rarely do we ever kind of move into the bigger picture um, yeah. when we're having conversations. And so this really is the bigger picture about what each of us are here to do. And I have been very clear for a very long time <laughs> what mm. my role is here. Um, nice. And I guess as teacher is what I would call it. Um, yeah. I came from a line of teachers. Uh, my mother taught second grade for 32 years in the same classroom wow. in a small rural town where I grew up. And then my aunt was a dean of a college of education for about a decade in the Midwest. Wow. And an uncle was a professor. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow. <laughs> uh, so I think I was a teacher before I realized anything. And, and I don't know that I ever called myself that initially yeah. because I was a counselor and I've been a psychologist. Uh, I have been a professor. Uh, I'm an author now. Um, I'm a business owner. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations <laughs> on all. So I'm an employer. And the one thread I think that goes through all of that is teaching. And of course, teaching is uh, a service to anyone yeah. who is in front of you. When you have those connections with people, you know, they always say that. The, the teacher, you know, the teacher's ready when the student shows up and the student's ready when the teacher shows up because I think it's a two-way thing because I think both learn in the exchange. I agree with you. I remember I grew up in the church and Jesus said, those who have ears, let them hear. Interesting statement that mm -hmm. tells us that there's another set of ears that we have and the onus is on the individual to be ready to hear. Mm -hmm. And so you, mm -hmm. I call them, we have a lot of people that are l l uh, lazy listeners, if you will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one of our customs here, Doc, is to go back. You briefly mentioned a little bit, um, uh, insert about your family. Um, the family is the first space by which we have an opportunity to, to reside there for a few years. And mm -hmm. we are learning from a couple of folks there. Our parents are... Um, grandparents, siblings, and all those things. Uh, we are getting data, if you will, because that is going to cause us to uh, make certain ways of choices and so forth. And since you have the DNA of teaching inside of you before you came to this planet, so let's uh, find out what was your family unit like. <laughs> Oh, yes. So uh, mother was a teacher before I was born, So, and she was a teacher after I was born. So <laughs> I think so I, I, if I recall, you know, it's, she's been gone for about 13 years now. So, um, yeah. gosh, I'm trying to think back. I believe the numbers are right. I think she was teaching business in high school six years before I was born wow. and then took a five-year gap when she had my me and then my brother. And then 32 years in the same classroom in second grade. So, you know, that oh. adds up to a lot of years of teaching. That's impressive. <laughs> Absolutely. Impressive. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then I grew up in a small rural community um, mm -hmm. in the Midwest and uh, on the family farm. So, wow. um and my dad ran the farm when uh, his dad had passed away at kind of an earlier age. 
us. So he had a lot of responsibility on him at, you know, in his 20s. And uh, so, you know, I think back on him, farm life, you know, I don't live on the farm anymore for a reason. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, you learn a lot on, on the farm because I grew up on one of those. <laughs> Early rising well, is one of them, you know, so yeah. yeah there's no downtime on a farm. <laughs> no, no. It doesn't matter what's going on. <laughs> yeah, I tell them, I said, you guys don't know. I would say to my kids, because I grew up on a farm, I tell them, so you guys don't know what child labor is all about. <laughs> there was no such a thing. It was like, you know, oh my gosh, I think the least favorite thing I ever had to do was when it was because it was in the Midwest. So it would be 90 yeah. degrees with 90% humidity and full sunshine. And we would be out working. And yeah. so uh, the summer was when we had to bale hay. Oh, yeah. it, you know, and you had to, you had to dress for it. I mean, you yeah. had to have a long sleeve clothing because you could get <laughs> scratched up and heavy jeans and socks and shoes and a hat and it's 90 degrees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow. Mm. <laughs> I learned a lot, though, Doc. I learned about mm. making um, cheese. I learned about uh, milking the cows. Um, I learned about even making coconut oil because we had uh, coconut. Oh, I, I, I was in um, British Guiana, South America, so we had all of those uh, tropical um, things around us. And so, yeah, I had to learn uh, dealing with uh, pigs and all of that stuff. So it was a fascinating lifestyle. Um, and I find myself as I'm getting older, uh, fantasizing more about it, <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. you, know, and I feel, you know, and then the, then the child labor memories start to hit. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's never, you, you never don't have something to do. So, yeah. you know, even in bad weather, I mean, the only break as kids we ever got was in the winter cause it would freeze. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, thankfully, we weren't required to go out and do all of that. Dad did that um, yeah. uh, during the winter. But, you know, it was just in any time when it was decent weather, you're either planting or, you know, tending or harvesting. And you, yeah. you've got that. We did have four seasons. So the winter mm. was about the only break that we as kids got. Um, to not really have to instill, there's still other things to do on a farm, you know, you just, yeah. it doesn't end. But, you know, it did, um, it did provide, I think, I, I'm really grateful for growing up in the Midwest. I've lived in a lot of different places in this yeah. country and I live in the Southwest now. Um, there's, there's something that when people are at events around here where I live, those of us from the Midwest end up talking to each other because there's just a sense of familiarity yeah. that uh, we carry that mm -hmm. I think is quite different from other parts. Like obviously, I didn't grow up in another part, but there's just there's a flavor and yeah. uh, we kind of know each other instinctively. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I think we have a little we have a, a kind of a different kind of an open um, connection. Uh, with yeah. people there because in a small community you kind of grew up knowing everyone mm -hmm. you know you knew everyone everyone knew you you also my mother was a teacher so yeah. I couldn't get away with anything anywhere <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. like the other kids could yeah, yeah. there's none of that because you know everyone knew my mother <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of had to that... walk us how did that affect your life? I mean, here you are. Everyone knows your mom in the school, and uh, you are in the midst of that. You have your farm mm -hmm. life, and, um, you know, you, you are known, as they would say. So how did that affect you as you were growing up, Ron? Well, my mother was well-regarded um, yeah. in the community. Uh, so she, uh, you know, as time grew on, of course, she taught children and then she actually ended up teaching their children. Yeah. So wow. we had two generations of people in the small community and literally everyone knew yeah. her. Uh, and my dad, she was not born and raised there, um, so, but my dad was. And so everyone knew my dad, too. Everyone knew everyone. Yeah. And there are pluses and minuses to this. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, 
the pluses are, yeah, you know everyone, yeah. but everyone knows you, and you can't yeah. look cross-eyed without someone, you know, saying, hmm. Mm hmm Yeah. So, well, yeah. I, um, and the, the kind of the one thing about it was there was kind of this sense of a closedness in some ways in this yeah. small community that uh, eventually I realized I needed to move beyond that. And yeah. that uh, by the time I was a mid-teenager, I had figured this out. Yeah. Uh, so I had figured out that I probably wasn't going to be there the rest of my life. Um, I didn't know where I was going to go yeah. <laughs> or where my you know journey would take me. <clears throat> but I knew it would be bigger and, and broader than what the community held there, even though it was kind of a nice safety net uh, yeah. to grow up in. You yeah. can go anywhere. You go outside. I, we play outside all day long. It, you know, things you can't hardly do so much anymore in certain areas of this country, at least, and in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we, we get mad. Go outside and play. I'm tired of you get down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is not funny. We used to play sun up to sundown after we finished working and whatever. It's just uh, running all over the place and yeah. um, getting exhausted and getting up in the morning started all over again you know <laughs> like i said so it was so here here you are you understood a couple of things as you're growing you understood that i need to get out of here <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so with that um with that decision made internally now you're going to begin to uh, initiate a plan if you will and that plan is to move forward in your education so that it will take you to that direction. Mm -hmm. And you'd mentioned that um, you did several other uh, things other than teaching and so forth. When you had made that decision, you're looking in your life, college time, and you're, it's time for you to migrate, if you will. Um, where did you migrate to as far as location? And what feel initially did you began to uh, that attracted you to to mm -hmm. uh, get involved in that so where i lived the the closest university was 45 miles away which was kind mm -hmm. of the one where people went to mm -hmm. uh, so back in those days so your freshman year you had to live in dorms it was required yeah. uh, so you know moved into the dorm in my freshman year <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, realized pretty quickly uh, that what life wasn't too much for me either because you're just packed with people all the time. Yeah. So everyone's around all the time. I had three roommates and a room about the size of what I'm sitting in right now. Wow. <laughs> there were four of us in there. And it's wow. just like, whoosh, that was a lot, you know, to deal with. So uh, it didn't take too long to figure out I wanted to be more in a house or an apartment with maybe one or two other mm -hmm. people. So did that and uh, spent two years at that university uh, really kind of puttering around with um, the general ed um, like a business and maybe psychology those were, I kind of was naturally drawn uh, yeah. to both of those and then I kind of realized I wasn't quite ready for all of that so mm -hmm. I left and actually started working and I was wow. 19 at that point so I actually started college when I was 17 just because of wow. how the birth years uh, yeah. ran back then. So I was 17 when I moved away to college um, and never moved back home, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if that's a congratulations or, <laughs> or not. <laughs> well, I was determined. Let's just put it yeah. that way. I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to be doing things. So yeah. um, I uh, kind of worked around through some uh, different types of jobs for a while, mm -hmm. a little bit of part time, and then landed a full time job where I was in personnel, which yeah. was a nice fit for me. I really liked it. It was with a utility company, a large utility company uh, in the region, and yeah. uh, worked there for several years and then kind of worked my way up. And I thought, you know, this isn't for me forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. I kind of took on a part-time job, I said a full-time job, again, just trying to find my way. So yeah. uh, I was in another business um, uh, doing some things on that line. And then, I don't know, one day I just remember thinking, you know, there's got to be more than this. Yeah. I've been yeah. doing this for six or seven years. Yeah. 
And awesome. in the meantime, I had finished my bachelor's degree somewhere <laughs> through all of that. <laughs> I, I had somehow managed to do that. And so I had my bachelor's degree. <clears throat> and then um, my decision point was I knew there was something else educationally. And I will give credit to my mother and my aunt, both teachers, yeah. uh, who said, you need to go on and <laughs> yeah. you know, get your master's degree now. It's time for you to do this. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, the way I did that, I did not know what I really wanted to get my master's in. And they have been very clear. You need to work a while, you know, with your bachelor's and work a while because you need to figure out what the next step is. And you need to know what you like and what you don't like before you go to another degree. Because every degree you get is more and more narrow. Narrow. And it will expand certain types of opportunities, but it narrows others. So you need to be you know, clear about what you want to study yeah. because that's a big step to get that master's degree piece. And so I thought, I don't have any ideas. So I went back to that <laughs> local university, <Yeah. laughs> went 45 miles. And I actually, this was in the day when they still printed all the catalogs with all mm-hmm. the course descriptions. And you, you went to the university and you picked up this really thick <laughs> book that yeah. has every degree, bachelor's and master's, and every program and a course description of every yeah. class. And nice. I, I remember those. <laughs> and I took it home and I just started reading yeah. the different programs because I really didn't know. And then the one that resonated the most with me, the course descriptions, was counseling, which surprised wow. me. I had never thought of that. Yeah. Uh, and so then I worked my way through my master's degree and uh, and then had my first job as a rehabilitation counselor, which really wow. is about um, helping people figure their way through challenges in life, uh, mm-hmm. looking at their strengths. Um, assessing their areas of weakness or areas that aren't working well for them, and then figuring out workarounds for yeah. that. And so it's the big workaround. It's like, well, you might have this, but you have this over here. So how can you kind of parlay your strengths into where you want to go and how you want to get there? And so, so I he, did that for seven years. Wow. So here you are, this girl, and um, she decided counseling. Now, you're studying counseling and all the principles within that, and those principles, all of them, always have to dig about you because you got to know you before you can start uh, getting to uh, all the other folks out there. Mm -hmm. As you began to study, Doc, and you brought those data into you and all the knowledge and the information, what did you start to discover about you? Mm-hmm. Well, and it's so true because with counseling, as you know, probably a lot of professions, but this one certainly has yeah. been mine for quite a long time. Yeah, it really does give you opportunities um, yeah. to start looking at patterns, mm-hmm. at beliefs, at um, kind of how one approaches situations in life. And you know, living on the farm, it's kind of a hard life. There's not a yeah. lot of um, you know, oh, poor you, you're not feeling well today. It's like, no, guess what? We've got work to yeah. do. <laughs> so, yeah. Come on, we've got to get this job done. Got to go. So it wasn't that there wasn't caring, but it was that you know, there was priorities. And priorities yeah. were you had, to get, you had to do the job. And yeah. boy, has that cut through. I can look through my whole life <laughs> and see that thread all the way through, which is you keep going even when you're needing to um, – you know, you want me, maybe you just want to sit down and not get this done, but you keep going. Yeah. And, and I think for me, learning a balance was really important between yeah. that um, thread of no matter what you keep going versus, you know, self-care. And I yeah. think that is, that's been a long journey for me. Uh, to what really tools did you bring in, Doc? What, did, mm-hmm. what tools did you bring in? Because, you, again, you have to be familiar with these tools and how to utilize your tool. And when you're on the farm, you have to learn how to use certain things and how to Mm -hmm. uh, be efficient with them. And as someone that is uh, uh, seeing and understanding the, I guess the, I always say you have the lab 
and then you have mm -hmm. the um, the practical stuff, and then you have the uh, the ones where you're studying in class. So now you have the your theory, if you will. You have your theories, and now you have to practice your lab within your life. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what tools did you bring in to help you to start making those adjustments, if you will, in your life? What were some of those that you utilized to help mm -hmm. yourself? <clears throat> well, there, you know, I think with our parents, you can gather things that work well and maybe yeah. things that you want to do differently. <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> because they give us both. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. You know, and so the things that I think were real benefits to all of that was not being afraid of hard work. Yeah. There's not a job in my company that I haven't done because yeah. I built it. So, you know, I know it from the ground up. So if someone, you know, kind of pushes back that they don't want to do it, it's like, wait a minute, we're all in this together. <laughs> You know, and that's, yeah. that's, you know, that's from farm life. We're all in this together. We had multiple, yeah. there were like six families in my family on my dad's side scattered within like a two or three mile range. And everyone came together, both for holidays yeah. and for hard work, you yeah. know, for projects. And so everyone rolled their sleeves up. Nothing was beneath someone to do yeah. because you just had to get the job done, you yeah. know. And then the other side of that was really, I think, um, Kind of this, both of my parents were from the Depression era. So that gives mm -hmm. you some uh, frame yeah. of reference for kind of the other side of uh, challenges in life and yeah. what that really meant to them uh, yeah. and, and generationally as well. Because in the Midwest, um, you know, nothing was guaranteed. When you're a farmer, yeah. there are no guarantees mm -hmm. about anything. Yep. You don't know yep. if that crop's going to make and you're going to have money. Yeah. Uh, to pay your bills if it makes and it's great if it's wonderful but if something happens and something comes through and you have your it's too dry and the crops, the crops don't make then you have to have reserves yeah. and i think yeah. sometimes there was so much emphasis on that reserve piece yeah. that it was hard for them to actually enjoy their life yeah. Um, yeah. because that wasn't the history of yeah. the midwest yeah. Um, yeah. particularly coming through the great depression like they did, they both were raised in that, and they grew up in the middle of all of that, uh, the dust bowls yeah. and such. So, you know, there was, there's a real um, awareness of that. And I will say that's probably the theme that has worked me the most yeah. <laughs> in my yeah. life of trying to resolve a little bit of that, because I think, I think there are such things as, uh, processes that are passed through DNA that, yes. you know, I think it came from grandparents and parents yep. and down to me on both sides yeah. because both of those families had come through very rough times. Um, yeah, I think children. it's that's a natural. I think um, uh, there's a degree of energy that we all are. And um, as that child in the, in the womb, that energy is um, because mom and dad are moving within it and the family is moving with it even before the child is born, that when that child comes out, that child is familiar with that type of energy, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you will see that's why you see um, men and women will uh, pick abusive partners because they're familiar with that energy and it's mm -hmm. safe to them because of that. And then they would have to learn how to my change from that. So here you are, you had an opportunity to see so many people as a counselor. What did you learn? Um, what was that thread within all of those people that came before you? What was that thread? Because that thread that you will be seeing is what is going to start propelling you to the next stage of your life. What was those familiar threads that you saw after chatting with all those people that they wanted a better life yeah that they wanted success within themselves they wanted yeah. to feel they were worthy in the world that they had something to contribute yeah um and that most of them didn't quite know how to get there they knew they wanted something better yeah but Society has a way of kind of defining barriers for people. And so part of that is helping people rewrite that narrative mm -hmm. about who they are 
and what they're about and why they're here. And so that was really the beauty of all of it is the field of rehabilitation counseling was so aptly positioned for that and was such a good fit uh, because I could just dive right into that. And I had a great supervisor during that time frame. And she would always say, she said, I'll do anything for a client except go to jail. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that. (laughs) So she was very much an outside the box thinker. And that's exactly where I am, which is why I I knew early on, I wasn't going to be able to stay in this little community (laughs) (laughs) because I didn't fit. I didn't fit in a box anywhere. (laughs) I never have. And that's that's one of the benefits of of why I've been able to do, I think, what I've done here is uh, be outside the box, to look at a different narrative. And, you know, that's within myself, obviously. I've done that, which is rewrite narratives. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember when I was early on as a counselor, how I knew to do this to this day, I do not know. Wow. I do not know because I don't recall anyone ever saying anything to me about this, but I instinctively knew how to do this, which was, and I remember one client came in early on in my career <laughs> and part of our job was to help people get jobs. So, yeah. you know, there's a lot to do for that if someone hasn't worked. And this, this guy somewhere in his late twenties probably came in, And he must have had at least 1,000 large safety pins attached to his clothing from top to bottom. (laughs) Wow. And he walks in my door, (laughs) and I'm thinking, hmm. (laughs) Okay. Wow. And so I started working with him, but I had an instinct. I just always had this instinct that I looked at him and I thought, I'm not going to give a lot of energy to these safety pins right now. I want to know who this guy is. (laughs) Yeah. And so let's see if I can figure out who this guy is. And that was all it took with him. Because what he was expecting was for me to be repelled by his appearance. Yeah. And what I came to understand with that one, that one situation is that, A lot of people are expecting rejection. Yeah. And so they will do things to set it up, to create it, so they can say, oh, yes, I was rejected again. See, I'm always going to be rejected. And when that didn't happen with him, he never wore those safety pins in again. Wow. He came in dressed like a regular guy the next time. That's a powerful story, Doc, because a lot of people self-sabotage their careers and their lives constantly. They do. Um, and that is the the perpetual um, uh, race or wheel that they find themselves on 30 years, 20 years um, in that perpetual wheel. And like you said, the gentleman showed up with, uh, with that mindset and but the mindset was glaring in what he did in order to self-sabotage and to have mm-hmm. uh, someone like you. And that's why I tell people it's very important to um, have a guide, as you said, that steps outside of the programming, that box that we call. And mm-hmm. when they step outside of that, their response is, a hundred percent different than what you, when you're in the mark because their their peripheral vision is wider and they're able to see much more and they're able to um, accommodate some of your creative creative thinking to sabotage your life and that person that is skilled will will see it in a second and as you did you did not even pay attention to it. As you are moving through, Doc, and you're, you spent your time there for several years, and uh, you began to move forward in your life, uh, when that uneasiness began to happen in your life, and because we all, I always tell people, there's this uneasiness that comes when we haven't gotten to our 
our mm -hmm. destination as yet. Yep. When that uneasiness began to manifest, what was it? And why did you think it started to manifest as far as for you personally? Mm -hmm. So when I took that job, I really anticipated being there for quite a long time. I had set, yeah. I actually set goals. I had yeah. this set of goals in my mind of things I wanted to do, like leadership goals. I wanted to be involved in the, the association. So that actually happened in the first year. <laughs> I, was, I ended up on the regional, like a national regional a committee. And it was like, how did I land here already, you know? <laughs> Usually you start at the local level. And so all of a yeah. sudden I was on a regional um, for a national organization. And then I spent 25 years on the executive committee at the national level for this wow. organization. But backing up a moment, there came a time when the goals, I realized at year six, I had accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish in that job. And yeah. now I'm wow. sitting there at my desk thinking, how did I do all of this in six years? I thought this was going to be like a career thing here for mm -hmm. me to do all of this. And it's like, well, hmm, I guess, <laughs> I guess there's a nudge here for yeah. something else. It's like, well, what do I want to do? And of course yeah. my mother and my aunt. <laughs> nice. <laughs> were going, hmm, you know, it's about time for you to go for your PhD. You know, you really need to start thinking about this. That is wonderful. I love you. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, hmm, okay. And so because I had been in these national leadership positions, yeah. uh, I had an odd thing happen one day. Someone called me. We had a national conference coming up soon. And one of the leaders called me and said, we need to put together this, this gathering for the rehab counselors at this national meeting. We've got about a month to do it. Can you take it on and get it done? And it was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> And so I put this whole thing together and I'm standing in that gathering yeah. and I'm talking to some people I kind of knew and I don't know how it even became a conversation point. But by the end of that, I knew which doctorate program I was going to apply wow. to. I was told it's the only one I should be applying to. This is the only one. It's the top program in the country. Uh, yeah. This is what you apply to. I'll write your, uh, there were like three of them standing there. We'll write letters of recommendation for you. So you've got mm -hmm. that. So just get this application in. And so this was in the fall and the application was due like January or February. Wow. And I did it. I applied and I had six reference letters. I only needed three, but I thought overkill is <laughs> not a bad thing for this because <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm going to get in. <laughs> this is the top yeah. program. You know, I knew players, apparently people I had known for years, I didn't know were associated yeah. with this university and still had standing at that wow. university. So talk about things just kind of falling together. It was remarkable. Isn't and it then funny I, how I, things I just I love that terminology that we use, Doc. Isn't it wonderful how things just start falling together? I, I always tell people nothing is falling together. It's being planned. You've been set up. Um, and I think what happens is that we set ourselves up because we tap into that desire. We do it quietly sometimes as mm -hmm. your mom and your aunt came and lit the fuse. And then mm -hmm. you began to, um, I, I tell people, we began to meditate on it because I believe we are meditative being, period. And so mm -hmm. when we meditate it, depending on how skilled you are, you will manifest that thing quickly. And mm -hmm. so you uh, began, I'm sure you did, began to meditate on, wow, that'd be interesting and, and all mm -hmm. this type of stuff. And so you began to send that, that energy. And guess what? When it was time, because they came directly to you, why didn't they go to someone else? Because you mm -hmm. called it in and you were ready. And so I think yeah, that's what happened. It is. My mother told me later, she didn't, she told me after I got accepted to this university. <laughs> and she said, she says, no one ever applies to just one doc program. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I think you were ready. I think the, your readiness, and I always say to people, your readiness will call the people into your, and the situations into your space because you are ready. 
you know, because you, um, five years ago you weren't ready. You know, so, but when that happened, you were ready. And once you made that decision, you got accepted. How did you feel? You know, I was just elated because, <laughs> and scared. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because I was I was moving twelve hundred miles away from my home area. Yeah. And for the first time in se since I was age seventeen at this point, I forget how old I was, close to forty I think at that point. Um I wasn't gonna have a job. <laughs> <laughs> because this was a full time dog program and yeah. it yeah. meant you moved and you lived in this other state, um, and all you did was this dog program. And so it wow. was really, a, it was a four-year program, and I decided before I even got there, it wasn't going to be a four-year program for me because I wasn't going to spend four years there and accumulate, you know, the cost of four years. Like, that program's yeah. going to get done in three years. Wow. And so I set the stage, and I was very deliberate with everything I did, uh, because you have to do your dissertation, but I knew mm -hmm. going in what I was going to do my dissertation on, uh, wow. because it came from my work, um, uh, yeah. from my previous job. And I knew the area that I wanted to study. Yeah. And, um, part of that was just really being very deliberate about how to get through a four year program in three years. And I did it. And, yeah. uh, my colleagues and I at the time, though, we said, you know, we were about halfway through that program. <laughs> we were all exhausted, mm -hmm. burned out. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, there's no exit strategy here other than to just keep going forward. So clearly they know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that it, and they set this up that you, you cut all ties to everything else when you go into yeah. this. And it's, you get halfway through and you're just wanting to bail because it's so intense. And like, yeah. there's no going back. <laughs> yeah. You can't turn around and retreat out of here. The only thing you can do is just keep moving forward. And yeah. the end will come to this. And I remember when I graduated um, in the department, they used to have a uh, like a national map up on the mm -hmm. wall by the elevator. And they had little red dots for where people uh, had taken positions and yeah. how long they had been out. And I remember standing there toward the end of my program and I thought, you know, there will come a time when I will have been out of here for 20 years like some of these people. Yeah. And now it has been far longer than that. And, wow. um, you know, it's been a great journey. Oh, that's a beautiful story. I love your um, the skillfulness in how you make your decisions and how you utilize your decisions. I tell, I always mention to people, uh, it becomes a, a, an art form when one makes wise decisions and how it propels you to accomplish what you did. You said and you declare what you wanted, and then mm -hmm. you put the motions in action to obtain what you wanted and the fact that you as you said you will become a purposeful designer and liver uh, uh, of your life with what you said you wanted and you stepped out to make it a reality mm -hmm. i tell people that that's the key to success <laughs> right mm -hmm. there you laid it out <laughs> and that person makes an, a decision and that decision is then backed up by the corresponding actions necessary mm -hmm. for you to fulfill what you just released. And so mm -hmm. that's how simple it is. We complicate it with all other emotional trauma that we have within us. And sometimes we can miss it. So here you are, you graduated. Because I want to know how you get to... Uh, learn about ADHD and all the stuff because my granddaughter tells me I, I suffer from it in great quantities. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, she told me, she's asked me a question like, Papa, you are a classic. And she's only, uh, she's now 13, 18, and she's been saying this for a long time. So <laughs> how did you then knock from here? You, you got your graduation, you got your PhD, looking at all those red dots. Where did you end up on that map? In two different places. So I started out um, at a university kind of in the eastern part of the country and was there for 10 years. And yeah. it was a good proving ground for me because I 
um, I was able to become tenured. I was promoted to the next rank. I did a lot of publications because that was a research two institution. So mm -hmm. you were expected to teach and to publish. And then that, of course, is when I was really fully into all the national um, activities as well. So I kind of had two jobs as I was really involved in that national leadership uh, activity for the 25 years that I was involved with them. Uh, so there was that whole piece that really gave me a platform. Uh, I yeah. did a lot of presenting during those years. I connected with people uh, around the country, around the world. <clears throat> and that was really a rich time. But the weather was horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where I was living. There was no sunshine ever. Yeah. <laughs> so I uh, was eligible for a sabbatical, and I had two friends out in the Southwest, one in one state, one in another state, and they both said, why don't you take a break from that weather and come this way? Yeah. So I put it out to the universe. It's like, whichever one of them gets the offer pulled together first, that's where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up in Southern California, and yeah. I was ever so grateful to land here. Uh, yeah. For six months after living in that really cold and damp environment for you know, 10 years practically. And so the nice thing about that sabbatical is um, I thought out. Yeah. <laughs> I found sunshine again. And yeah. uh, it went so well that they actually created a position for me at that university and asked me to apply. And, you know, there was competition. Yeah. There were other people obviously that applied. But I was fortunate enough to be selected, and they brought me in as a full professor on a very wow. short tenure clock here. So I got credit for the tenure I had at the other um, yeah. university, which um, apparently they don't do anymore. I'm not saying I'm yeah. different, but that was a long time ago. There were different, yeah. you know, a lot of different things in the world at that time. So they had the latitude to do that, and, and yeah. so that was really great. And that all led to uh, part of what had happened is they were moving into a brand-new building. So the yeah. College of Education was finally getting pulled together at this university. They'd been scattered across the campus for the entire time of that university. Yeah. And somehow they'd managed to build this great new beautiful building, and everyone was moving into it. And they had set aside about, oh, gosh, I think it was about 5,000 square feet probably, uh, yeah. classrooms in this space. And no one wanted to take on the project to build something wow. for this area and so i'm the new kid on the block it's like here let her do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're gonna give it to her we kind of like a yeah. commercial so i was thrilled to have the opportunity to create something of that magnitude that i had never yeah. done before uh, i learned a lot in the process because there were yeah. a few critical questions I had forgot to ask, like, what's the budget for this? Hmm. <laughs> Got into it. There wasn't yeah. one. <laughs> that was a big surprise. <laughs> wow. So, oh, I'd already rolled programs out to the community that I built and was ready to hire people. They go, oh, there's no budget to hire anyone. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> what? Wow. <laughs> I'm thinking my reputation's on the line everywhere here because I've told them we're going to start delivering this and I'm ready to hire yeah. people for it. It's like, oh, we don't have any money to hire anyone. <laughs> that was a defining moment in my life. <laughs> yeah. How because did you I get yourself to, out? Well, you know yeah. what? There is this thing of determination. Yeah. I've got Irish and Scottish in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going down on this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going down. So it was, I still don't know how I came up with all the ideas that I did other than yeah. it was outside the box thinking. Um, mm -hmm. There were people uh, there who were dedicated to supporting me in whatever I needed. And one of those was the dean at the time. Um, and then there were other people that this dean had told, do whatever it takes to help her. So that yeah. was a big contributing factor. So it was one of those people who helped me. But then there was just this, I mean, Irish and Scottish, it's a good mix some days and not so good other <laughs> days. Because, <laughs> but it, I pulled on my bootstraps. You talk about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. That's exactly yeah. what this took. And there was, I'll admit, yeah. there were a lot of sleepless nights on that because I had to figure out how to get people hired with no budget. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I did. I figured out right. how to do it, and I still look wow. back on that 
Um, and I think there were just, obviously, I'll say it this way, there were the powers that be within the realm that wanted this work to come forward. Yeah. And so at every turn where something was an absolute need, it showed up. Wow. And it, there were times when I would hold a thought. It was like, you know, I really need someone who can help me do this. And I'd be sitting at my desk, and like a day later, some strange person would just walk in. I was in a, in an area where you had to walk through the reception area, down the hallway to get to my office. Mm -hmm. And I would look up, and someone would be standing in my door, and I wouldn't know them. And they would say, you know, I was just thinking, um, I'm kind of interested in what you're doing here. Um, this is what I, I do. Is there a fit? Yeah. And that wonderful. happened over and over and over. And yeah. someone would say, hey, you need to apply for a grant here. So I'd apply for this grant and we'd get the funding. We could buy the equipment. Or someone would say, hey, you know, we're refurbishing. We're, we're switching out all these computers. We're going to have these computers. Uh, do you want them? It's like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. So I created this institute. And within that, to kind of wax uh, uh, jump forward it's within that where i learned about neurofeedback uh yeah. from a colleague we mm -hmm. started um i did a pilot project to mm -hmm. work with children with adhd and veterans who had ptsd and yeah. i started that project and we just did it as a trial um we weren't charging anyone anything for it and so i set up this uh, kind of a, a loose study but a study uh, to see what we could accomplish with this neurofeedback. I didn't know if it was going to work or not, and I sure wasn't going to put it out in the community as a service until we had data. Yeah. And so yeah. we just put it out, everyone we knew. It's like, well, bring your child. You know, it's free. We're learning how to use all of this. We promise we won't hurt your kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> and uh, we started working with veterans, and so uh, people needed help. I worked at the VA while I was in my dog program. So I yeah. had kind of a passion for helping veterans who were struggling with PTSD. And then it just kind of rolled forward from there, which is the phone started ringing about three months yeah. in. The phone started ringing, and I'll never forget the first call. It was, you know, you're working with my neighbor's son, and we're seeing such a big difference in him. His behavior is so much better. Uh, can you work with my son? And it was like, okay, come on in. And that's yeah. how it, and 15 years later, that is still yeah. going on. Um, wow. I've done a lot of presentations, but it's a lot of word of mouth in using this approach, rewriting the narrative, and all of it wraps together because it's about people who want to do better and it's about changing the narrative of this. And that self-sabotaging, it starts mm -hmm. early on. It starts oh, yeah. when these children are very young. And again, wax back to my mother of 32 years in second grade. Let's not forget the anchor that that yeah. created which is children who are struggling in second and third grade and they can't learn are going to have a lot more problems as they go on. Yeah. And so I wrote this book. It's for all children. It actually applies to all adults on the planet, too, who struggle yeah. uh, with these auditory and visual processing problems. But what I came to understand is that the label of ADHD really needs to um, kind of be peeled back. Because yeah. we need to understand underneath what that label is. We need to understand that there are auditory and visual processing problems that are really contributing to the behaviors. So the behaviors are just the signals. They're the communication tool that people are using, that children are using to try and say something isn't working. Uh, and so if we can pull back from that flash of, oh, you're just not paying attention. This is a willful thing. You're just not paying attention. You need to just pay attention more. If someone could pay attention, they would be. They would, yeah. That's what it comes down yeah. to. It, um, I remember when they uh, were over-diagnosing the young kids with uh, the ADHD uh, diagnosis. and what Because I came from the medical side and saw some of the effects as to what it does to families. And um, not knowing that those children... Uh, very bright kids is just um, how they see things in different ways by which you can begin to impact their lives. And so, yeah, I've seen a tremendous amount of damage, if you will, from the over-prescribing of that term. Um, mm -hmm. 
to individuals that change their lives forever. So it's really good to see someone like yourself that are now bringing in tools that began to help with that situation. So as you were doing all of this, talk to us a little about the data. Because when it comes to this piece, um, people need to understand the data because they're accustomed to hearing, grab that medication, grab that thing, medicate the child, put them under, all the other things that they talk about. But as you have been on outside the box for a mighty long time, your entire <laughs> life, you're able to see something different. Give us mm -hmm. some information as to the data when it comes to biofeedback. Mm -hmm. So it's, it just um, gave me such pleasure at the front end of this to be able, like 15, so I've been doing this for 15 years. So mm -hmm. it took five years for me, though literally five years of doing this to say, I think there's something going on here <laughs> because <laughs> no one was talking about this. Yeah. And so no one was talking about what I was seeing. And I kept, I kept thinking, I need to get around and get into the literature. I need to find the literature. You know, it was just, we were busy. And so yeah. it took a while for me to start, you know, really digging in to that. But the bottom line was children were coming in. Parents had tried everything, so they were on medications. They'd gone down all the medications in some cases, and ch the child still wasn't doing well. Was They were struggling. The family was struggling. The teachers, everyone was struggling was the theme. Everyone yeah. was struggling. And so when we run this assessment, it, it takes 20 minutes to get at this right. information. And the information, it breaks out across auditory and visual um, measurements that uh, look at things such as processing speed. Who 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 figures out processing speed? Well, processing yeah. speed, it turns out, is very critical from the standpoint that if you have a slow processing speed, you will likely be labeled a slow learner yeah. in school. You can be brilliant, but if you have slow processing speed, you're going to be categorized, at least, as a slow learner. Yeah. And a slow learner in school yeah. implies generally that there's a cognitive or an intellectual delay. Mm -hmm. And so then that triggers interventions that are tied to that misdiagnosis. And so this child is going down this pan this track that isn't the right track. And I'm looking, so there's, there's that one, there's 37 areas that I look at with this that we can figure out. And what's so fascinating is when we run these assessments, and I'm sitting with the parents. So the child's off with one of the technicians doing the assessment. I'm still sitting with the parents. The technicians bring the report in, and I start going over the report. And nine times out of ten, the language in the report is what the parents were just using to describe their child. Huh. And so there's an immediate connection with the information because they know it's real. They know yeah. for the first time that we've been able to figure out, okay, what this is. It's not. They'll say, my child's bright, but, you know, he or she is being targeted as, you know, not being bright. I know my child's smart. It's like, yes, your child's smart, yeah. <laughs> but here's what's going on, and this is what we can do about it. So with the biofeedback, which is just a different name for neurofeedback, mm -hmm. we actually use brain training. So we use very low-impact training games um, that help through repetition the brain to learn. So we're not yeah. doing anything to the brain. The child and the adults, I work with a lot of adults too, yeah. um, use the computer. We're pulling this brainwave signals from the brain, just as you would like your pulse. You measure your mm -hmm. pulse, we're just measuring brainwaves. And that interacts in the computer. And because it's a nearly instantaneous process, we can tell and people can learn when they're not paying attention. Because if you can't pay attention, you're not paying attention to when you're not paying attention. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a yeah. circle. And so we want to get people out of that so that they mm. can figure out what this looks like. What's and so like? with that yeah. feedback, then they can get that. And then they can allow their brain to get trained and get stronger. Yeah. And these areas that are needing to be strengthened. And the beauty of this is that this is how the brain has always learned. You've always learned through repetition. There's nothing new here under the sun except how we do it. 
And yeah. as the software developer says, it is rocket science on the back end of this. <laughs> But the front end of it, it isn't rocket science. Yeah. So that's what's nice. So the interface with the person is very doable. Uh, people learn and children become self-empowered. And that's what yeah. I see such a huge difference in is that yeah. children who've been in trouble at home and at school for not paying attention, for losing their homework, for not doing all these things that they're supposed to do, they become disempowered. Yeah. And so that's where the messages start to land internally that could stay with them for the rest of their lives. And so the goal of all of this is what, no matter what age it is, it's to change that up. Because if you suddenly realize you can run a computer with your brain, that's a game changer. Yeah. Suddenly you realize, well, wait a minute, I can do this. And suddenly you start winning these programs or these games and you start realizing you can pay attention better now because People aren't telling you to pay attention all the time yeah. when you realize you weren't paying attention. You have no way of knowing you're not paying attention. And suddenly all that starts to drive go away. And you realize you're not getting in trouble as much. It was like, oh, I got my spelling words right today. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, this is cool. And so kids love it. Parents love it. Teachers love it. And so instead of a lose, 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 we go to a win, 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 where with this process, everyone wins. Everyone wins. And that, that was the deal awesome. that had to be there. Everyone had to win. And they do yeah. with this. That is awesome. And guys, you're listening. Um, I'm going to provide the link so you guys can have access to that. Um, uh, Doc has provided at her site a brief uh, assessment for you guys mm -hmm. so that you can begin to uh, get some answers. And um, I'm going to make sure you guys are able to get in touch with her or get all of her information because it's. Uh, will change your life. You know, mm -hmm. everyone wins, as Doc said. They do. And this is also for the the adults, trauma, all of those different things. And uh, uh, that's what it is all about. Meditation is a way that one rewires their brain. And mm -hmm. that's all it is. And so we have a tool in neuroscience and so forth that is able to assist you in getting the correction that you need and that's what all of trauma and all those things is we are simply rewiring our brain we're bringing different tools as i mentioned meditation yoga um journaling all those things are tools to rewire your brain so that you can begin to move through your trauma and get to the other side and i have someone that is more than capable that has been living outside the box for a mighty long time. And she has the data to prove that, that what they're doing is successful. And so I wanted you guys to uh, have access to her. So here you are, Doc. You are, it's moving, all is well. Um, is there a disturbance within the force, as I say to people? You know, when we get there, that little thing, because I know you had that little thing in you all the way through. You're like, there's more. There's more. Is there a disturbance in the force that's telling you, I, I want some more? Or you're, you think that you're there, if you will? I think I'm just starting. And every <laughs> every January 1, it feels like, wow, I'm just getting started. Nice. <laughs> I'm just getting started. And so, oh, heck, 2024, um, I really want that to be a breakthrough year, breakout year for this work globally. Yeah. Because if we can find the second graders and third graders yeah. who are struggling, what we know is that if children aren't reading on grade level by the end of third grade, you know, children are learning how to read up through third grade. And when fourth grade starts here in the States, at least, yeah. Children have to read to be able to learn. And yeah. if you have attention and concentration and memory problems, all of that's going on, it's interfering. And that's where things start falling apart. And for children, it gets tougher as they now move into fourth, fifth, sixth grade, get into junior high. This is where behaviors really will start escalating uh, for some children because they don't know what to do. Um, they may have been kind of moved along through the academic 
world that happens sometimes they get missed yeah. other times the behaviors become so egregious that they either get kicked out of school or they end up on the streets yeah. and so if we could stop all of that and we can do it with a 20 minute assessment yeah <laughs> we need to get some we lobbyists guys it. Yes, <laughs> you need some some lobbyists to get into yes, the politician in that area uh, because mm -hmm. that will have a tremendous amount of impact coming from that level. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think when what it is when you guys have to produce the data, show them savings, how much mm -hmm. they would save from that. It's and enormous, the enormous. Yeah. We could be saving the educational system literally billions, billions of dollars. Of dollars. <laughs> billions with a B. So, billions. Yeah, you, you guys need to put that together, man. I think that's the way to go. We got to get you guys some lobbyists and show that um, that mm -hmm. those numbers because that is, um, yeah, because the medication. But you you have a competition that is going to be arguing a different point mm -hmm. of view, and so you guys have to. Um, but I think it's doable. I really do mm -hmm. think so because. Um, I know of some of the success that you guys have. Mm -hmm. uh, I know many of them. And so I think you have a product that can change the lives of generations. And so you got to find we a way. Can. Yeah. We can change society. We can change the educational yes. system. Yeah. We can change all of it and make people's yeah. lives easier. That's the yeah. key here because everyone's struggling with this. Teachers, yeah. they're not immune to being so frustrated with a child yeah. who can't sit still. Burnouts. Um, oh yeah. my gosh, the burnouts yeah. are horrible yeah. for teachers and the children yeah. aren't thriving with this. Teachers aren't thriving when they're yeah. in these high pre cooker, you know, pressure cooker situations and they're uh, struggling with a child who can't sit still and can't learn. Uh, the pressure on them is enormous. The pressure on the parents is enormous. The pressure on the school is enormous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we can imagine, we can reduce the pressure here. Yeah. And also we've got the, a VA. the VA, the yes. VA is another place. So you guys have, I mean, um, I, you know, your vision, I think is a powerful vision. And if you're the one that is spearheading it, I think it'll happen before they even <laughs> know it. <laughs> because every single thing that you set your mind to do, you have done it at a rate faster than even you from every story you told me everything you got to achieve you achieve every single one of them so i think you might be able to pull it off Tom. if there's anyone on this planet i think you may be able to pull it off <laughs> i think they got a different group crew uh, you know um when you come in their space so uh doc i want to thank you so much for coming to thank threads you. of enlightenment this has been a really beautiful conversation i had an opportunity to sit with someone who knows how to utilize their decisions their thoughts in such a powerful way and profound way that you achieve everything at a miraculous rate if you will and i am honored to have this conversation and thank you so much for coming to the rest of the line. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you.